We're going to return this series of messages we started quite a while back, if you remember, a couple of months ago, actually. As we talk about, you know, I remember when I was a kid here for the first time, I may not know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. The faith that we have is becoming real right now, isn't it? We're living in a world, this, was, this series was planned way before what we see going in and unfolding right now in the Middle East and, and scattering from there. No one should be surprised by that. We started with this idea that maybe we don't know what's going on right now, but Jesus had something to say about it. And so we've gone to this amazing passage of Scripture. And we're going to go past that because you gave me permission to do that a few weeks ago to continue this past. We'll go into chapter 25 a little bit, and maybe I'll jump over to Revelation a little bit. We have this thing called Christmas coming up, and I promise that I'll preach a little bit about that, but we're going to wrap that up, um, wrap it inside of, continue this series of message till we get to the end of this journey together. And I think we all want to see that done. Jesus is walking out of the temple. His disciples are with him. And they turn and they look at probably the most incredible building that existed on the planet during that particular time. And admiring this great temple, they were looking, look, Jesus, at this great building. And Jesus says, don't you realize there's coming a day when not one of these stones will be on top of the other again. And they turn to him and ask, as they many times ask Jesus questions, when is this going to be? How will we know of the end of the age? And Jesus began to answer their question. And we've been some walking chronologically through this particular passage of Scripture to see what Jesus had to say about that. And I can't give any detail because we've got to go through this in Cliff Notes versions, but I know that these are all archived sermons. If you want to go back and, and get more information about what we talked about different things, you can certainly do that. But I want to remind you what Jesus had to say. The first thing he said, well, he brought up a thing called birth pangs. Birth pangs, those are preliminary things that happen in a, a lady's time when they are pregnant. I've experienced that in my home a few times. My wife has been pregnant six times. We've had three children that made it all the way to the finish line. We've gone through disasters and struggles and heartache with losing children the whole bit. But I've, I can tell you a little bit about what it's like to be by a wife when she walks all the way through that as well. And in the beginning times, maybe there's a few pains and some agonies, but as it goes on, two things happen. Those pains get more frequent and the intensity picks up. Jesus says you can compare what's going to happen in our world to a woman who's had childbirth. As she gets closer, the frequency and the intensity of these things will take place. I don't have time to preach that whole sermon. Y'all remember what some of those things were? Wars and rumors of wars. Check. There's going to be a time when there's going to be a falling away from the faith in the world. We talked about that. Check. There's going to be an increase in natural disasters. It talks about earthquakes and things like that. Check. There's going to be a time when prophecy is going to be fulfilled in the fact that there are going to be false prophets that will arise everywhere else you can imagine. Check. We can keep going. Are we perhaps living in the, fa the final days? Absolutely, we could be. There's no question about it. So birth pangs was the first step that will take place. He says following that, there's going to be a time when the Antichrist is going to raise his ugly head. He's going to go to a place called Jerusalem and set up his kingdom. He's going to call upon the whole world to worship him as God, and it's going to be a very tragic time for the Jewish people. Jesus even says in this passage of Scripture that the Jews, when you see this happening, you flee, you run. Don't go back to your house and collect your stuff. Don't get your coat. Don't get all the pictures you have in the photo albums. Flee immediately to the mountains. The Bible, I recorded two Old Testament passages. We won't go back through all that. Say that two-thirds of the Jewish race will be wiped from the earth. It'll be savage. In fact, we're going to talk more about that in just a minute, how bad that's going to be. It's going to be a very difficult time. During that time, of course, he's going to raise up and start this kingdom to himself. And that's going to start a thing called the Great Tribulation. It's like a clock that starts when that happens. When he raises his head, a seven-year tribulation will start. I don't have time to preach this message. I wish I could one more time. But I want you to know that I believe with all of my heart, based upon my study of Scripture and my faith, that prior to that moment, there's going to be an event called the rapture that will take place. The word rapture does not appear anywhere in the Bible, but the event is described with unbelievable detail. In other words, it was a capturing of his people. Jesus is going to return in the sky and call his church to himself. He will not step foot on this planet. He's going to appear in the sky and take his church from this place. I believe that's going to happen before the tribulation. It's okay for you to believe otherwise. I won't argue with you about that. That's what I believe based upon my study and upon my faith in Jesus Christ. But at that moment, it's going to be a terrible, terrible time because that leads to the great tribulation. In chapter 24, you remember verse 21, it says that this time will be the worst time ever on this planet and never to be that bad again. 
Let me say this as a parenthesis before I go any further. You do not want to be on this planet during the Great Tribulation. Amen. You don't. There, there are people in this room this morning that are playing games with your faith. You're mailing it in on Sunday. You're reading your Bible maybe on Sunday morning perhaps. You may pray over every meal every day, but you're mailing it in with your faith. You're half in and you're half out. You're lukewarm before the Lord, and the Lord does not want that for you, doesn't desire that for you. And I believe that perhaps billions, certainly millions of people, when Jesus comes back, are going to think that they're saved, that they're not saved. If I can say anything to you before we go any further, get this settled in your life. These things I've written to you believe on the name of the Son of God, 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. These things I've written to you believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. I don't know what the mo tomorrow holds. I drove through three states to get home yesterday. The gas prices were as much as 60 cent different in each state. Can you imagine that? I don't know if they're going to go up or down tomorrow. Is the stock market going to go up or down tomorrow? I don't know. But I can tell you this, there's one thing that I do know. Sudden death, sudden glory for Phil Griffin. Whatever happens to me, Faith called and said, Daddy, I want y'all to get on that ship. I'm a little bit afraid y'all getting on that ship. Whatever, listen to me. If something happens to me, you don't pity me one little bit. For me to live as Christ that dies gain, Paul says, and I understand that more the older that I get in this life. And so the point is this, if there's anything in your life you need to settle, it's that. You don't need to walk around hoping or wishing or whatever. These things I've written to you that you may know you have eternal life. You do not want to be on this planet. It'll be the worst time ever on this planet, never to be duplicated again. Now what happens during that time is unbelievably tragic. As I just said to you, it says that, that of the Jewish race, two-thirds that are trying to flee will be slaughtered in the streets. Imagine what that's going to be like. What we're seeing now is not even a precursor to something that tragic and that bad. Jesus is going to raise up 144 believers, these Jewish believers that will be scattered all over the world, and they'll be drawing people to Jesus during that time. Yes, many people will come to Christ during the Great Tribulation. But that'll be a difficult time to be a Christian on this planet. Trust me, the persecution will be overwhelming and unbelievably difficult. But at the end of that, we've kind of got to, we got to press on. I love talking about all this, but you've got to press on from it. But the point is this, at the end of that tribulation, Jesus steps forward. This is beautiful. <laughs> it's like he walks over. I was, I was out of town. My son-in-law went in my dining room and made my lights work. I know we're working in our house. I was like, last night I flipped that thing. I was like, wow, we got lights in here now. This is a, a great thing. Jesus steps forward, and it says he calms and cuts off the sun, the moon, and the stars. Why would he do such a thing? The Bible says in Revelation that, he, that all of heaven is illuminated by the glory of Jesus. We don't need electricity. There we have Jesus. And so it says Jesus literally almost figuratively just cuts the switch off, blackens out everything, and he comes riding on the clouds to step foot on this planet again and set up his unbelievable thousand-year reign on this earth. That's kind of where we've been to get to where we are today. Amen. And so this title of this message I gave, I had a lot of thoughts about what I could call this, when you least expect it, expect it. Let's walk through this little outline that I've given you this morning. I don't think this will be too painful, but it's important that we go through this passage as well, and we'll keep pressing forward every week to the next text. First thing I noticed when I studied this was a lack of concern. Write that down, a lack of concern. And if you look with me at verse 36, the Bible says this, but of that day and hour, no one, it says, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. He's the only one that knows when this is going to happen. Isn't that interesting? For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. We're going to come back and talk about this in detail in a second. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken. The other will be left. 
Can I be honest with you and say, I've only been alive for 60 years, but I can say this, in 35 years as a pastor, I've always been alarmed at how quickly people can get upset about something or get on nerve about something or get concerned about something and that so quickly fade away really quickly. Can I be honest and say, I don't know how someone is living in the United States today that's ever even cursory read the Bible or knows anything about the Bible that would not be a little bit concerned about what's going on in our world. And yet there doesn't seem to be. There's way more concerned about things that do not matter. Listen, the Bible is coming alive right before our very eyes. It's really amazing when you think about it. It's not like it's never happened before, but it's, it's really unbelievable the details of the Bible we see coming alive right before our very eyes. And yet it seems like in this world today, there's no concern. All the way from the White House to your house. We have a president of the United States today, by the way, that says, I'm a practicing Catholic. I believe that Jesus is Lord, who stands idly by and endorses things that the Bible is, con I mean, completely against. There's no even way you can read it sideways and make it not be that. To stand up and say that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and say that homosexuality is a, just an alternate lifestyle, not a sin before God, is to dis dismiss the Bible altogether. To stand up and say it's okay to kill a child in a mother's womb is to, is to take the Bible and throw it in the garbage can. And yet we have in the White House, all the way down, people that somehow dismiss that and just connect their mind somewhere else when it comes to the things of God. I don't know how that happens, but it does. And so there seems to be no concern in the world today about what really is going on in the world. And this text is going to remind us that we ought to be very concerned about what's going on in the world, and we ought to be unbelievably alert to what's going on in our world today. There seems to be no concern. No concern. In fact, the dismissal of the things that we see in the Bible taking place in the press every single day. I want you to imagine with me what's going to happen. The Bible says when the rapture occurs, that millions and millions and millions of Christians are going to leave this earth. They're going to vanish from this earth to go be with Jesus. Number one, I hope that I'm not here to watch the news that night, but if you were here to watch the news that night, all the conspiracy theories will fly everywhere, won't they? What happened? What happened to all these people? It has to be the aliens, right? They've brought that one up recently. Maybe it's going to be that, or maybe it's some curse, or maybe, who knows? They'll come up with something, won't they? This Antichrist will step up and he'll have an answer, won't he? He'll explain it all away. And what will happen is unbelievably very quickly after that, I mean, it's going to leave chaos on the earth for a minute. But unbelievably soon after that, things will be put back in order. And the Bible says they'll just go back to living life just like it ever was. How can that be? Now, I've read all of my life this passage of Scripture and known this passage all my life, and in particular, verses 40 and 41, these words, and there were two men in the field, one was taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one will be left. The Bible has direct, re every word in the Bible has a direct reference. The New Testament's a lot easier. When it talks about he's writing to the church at Corinth, for example, he's writing a letter to that particular church. But the supernatural part of what the Bible is, is though it has a direct reference to one particular people, we can read it 2,000 years later, and it blesses and speaks to us too. There's a direct reference in Bible, and there's indirect reference in Bible. Now, I want to say to you that all my life, I thought this was a, really a connection to the rapture. But having read this and keeping it in its context, perhaps... It's not. And so I will say this to you. Do, is that going to happen when the rapture takes place? Are there going to be two people out in the field perhaps grinding or doing some work and doing some chores or maybe your office talking about something that's going on at work and all of a sudden one is going to, yes, that's going to happen. But I believe the reference, the direct reference here is actually when Jesus comes and steps foot back on this earth again, that's when a great reckoning is going to happen. That's when he's going to separate those sheep from the goats, right? Yep. And what he's saying here is I'm going to capture mine and the other will go to judgment. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. There's an invitation open this morning. Did you know that? By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, heard a pastor recently say, you, you know God's grace very well this morning because he could have killed you overnight and been justified in doing so, but he let you live. Amen. He didn't just let us live, he saved us. He grafted us into the vine. He made us part of his family, right? That's what he's done for us. And so, I mean, think about that for just a minute. 
At that great reckoning, that great reckoning day, there's going to be a total separation for those that are part of his body and those that are not, and it's going to be a great judgment. Right now, the invitation is still open. His arms are open wide. He's crying for you to come to him. He's done everything in his power to save your very soul. And all he asks of you really is just to come to him and take this free gift he's given to you. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me translate that for you. You didn't do anything to deserve it. You can't do anything to earn it. It's a gift he has for you. All he wants you to do is take it. And yet most people, the best estimates we have is three-fourths of this world's population rejects Jesus as Lord. How sad. How sad. The invitation is still open. If you're not in Christ, run to him today. Get on that ark before it's too late. That ark is Jesus. And so, could it be that this is talking about something different? It could be both. I know that. And it will be both. But think of that horrible day when Jesus comes back and the multitude of millions of people who heard the gospel and heard someone praying for them and knew the gospel but never responded to it. And at that moment, listen to me, it's going to be too late. The invitation one day is going to close. Praise God, it's still open. But one day, God shut the door of the ark. And one day, he'll stop the invitation. I'm unbelievably concerned today that there's a lack of concern, even in the body of Christ today, that we're more concerned about what's going on on Facebook or, or the next little gadget we need to buy or whatever is going on in our world today, what's, what our favorite music gr group is and what they're doing these days. And boy, Taylor's having the greatest concert series. She made $100 million. That seems to be the concern of our world today. And in the midst of all that, Jesus is bringing his Bible alive right before our very eyes. Where's the concern in the body of Christ? Where's the concern that you have for those people you claim are your friends that don't know Jesus? Cry out to them like you never have before. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So there's a lack of concern. That's the first thing that I noticed when I studied this, a lack, a total lack of concern. Number two, the lesson communicated. The second thing I noticed was there's a lesson here for every one of us, and it starts in verse 42. Let me read verse 42 and verse 44. And if you want to fill in the blank, the, the next thing I want to talk about is the stakes are real. Don't miss this. Verse 42, it says, therefore be on the alert for you do not know which day the Lord is coming. Verse 44, for this reason, you also must be ready for the son of man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will, which is where we get the title for this entire message. My friends, the stakes are real. This is not a parable. This is not a nice little story that's in the Bible. This is not fun and games. This is real. Jesus, my friend, 100% count on it, is coming. And I believe he's coming soon. And all that we can do is prepare ourselves for that. I'm going to talk to you in a minute about how we do that. But the most important thing I can say to you again today is this. Are you ready the stakes are real. Number two, the stakes are high. The stakes are high. In verse 43, it says this, but be sure of this, if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. The stakes are high. My friends, this is life. And this is death. This is life and death eternally. It's amazing. If I were to tell you today that I got a phone call and I know this is real and you know this is actually authentic, that you'd won the sweepstakes and whatever, they're coming by your house today to bring your check for a million dollars. Unlike when we were told by the cable company, we'll be by between three and seven o'clock and, and we call and complain, can you please tell me, you bought a nice brand new oven from Lowe's and they get, you know, you've spent thousands of dollars on this device and they can't even tell you within an hour when they're going to bring it to you. I mean, it kind of hacks you off, doesn't it? If I told you today, sometime today, the sweepstakes folks are coming by with their million dollar check and you, it's real, it's, this is for real. I don't think anybody would whine and complain about staying up 24 straight hours to make sure they were ready for when they got there, especially if they said you have to be present to receive the prize. 
You stay up 24 consecutive hours to be ready. If I told you, gentlemen, that I know with great certainty I have the gift of prophecy, a really bad guy is coming by your house today at 2 o'clock, and he wants to do damage to your family. How many of you would go and get something to eat and hang out at the mall and, and maybe drive home five minutes before 2 o'clock? Not one of you. You'd go home as soon as church was over, and you'd make your plan. I don't know how you want to defend your house, but gentlemen, you're not a man of God if you're not willing to protect and care for your home. I believe that with all my heart. You pick your device, it may be a baseball bat, it may be a gun, but you ought to be prepared to defend your home. So if I were to tell you at two o'clock today, I know with great certainty there's somebody coming to do harm to your house, think anybody in this room, these men, and probably ladies too, would go straight home and make a defense and be ready for those people to come and do this. Jesus says, you don't know the hour, you don't know the day, but I'm coming. Count on it. I'm coming. And the best thing you can do is to get ready. I told you, my very first job ever, I was underage, I wasn't probably supposed to work at that time, was at Northgate Gulf on Highway 153. It doesn't exist anymore. And I'm kind of sad. It went into being a a place where they cleaned up cars and did kind of wax jobs on cars. And it became a Verizon cell phone store for a long time. And I, last time I drove by, they've torn the building down. Watching online right now from Florida is probably my, my old boss, Jimmy Singleton. He's been in really poor health and has fought through it and just released from the hospital. And his daughter stays in touch with me, Stephanie. And we've known each other really our whole, whole lives. First time in my life I ever heard this, when, whenever there w wasn't a busy time around the old gas station, this is when they had a full, I know y'all have never seen this, they used to have a full service gas station. You could pull in and somebody would walk out and gladly put gas in your car for you. We would clean your windshield, we would check your oil, we would check the air in your tires for no charge. Those days are gone. We would like to have one of those, there may be a, still one of those around, but that was the average place. To, and I worked at a place like that. And when it would kind of in the middle of the day when everybody had already got to work and there wasn't much going on, there were some times, there were some lean times. You know what I mean when I say lean times? First time in my life I heard these words. If you got time to lean, come on, you got time to clean. Jimmy Singleton ran a really good shop, and when we had time to not do something, we found something to do. We stayed busy. But how many of us in this room play video games on our computers when we're at work instead of working, and when the boss comes down the hallway, it's like all of a sudden we switch things over. I'm not bright enough with computers to know how to do that. So I don't play video games on my computer at work. I don't use my computer as much as some people, but the point is simply this. You need to hear this. Who you are when no one is watching is who you really are. Do you hear me? Being prepared for Jesus to come back is to be the consistent person. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. The consistent person behind the doors when no one's watching. My first church, I jokingly say this, my first church had no staff but me. I was the only paid employee of the church. We had a lady that came by graciously once a week and she would write the two or three checks for the three or four bills that we had as a church, an electricity bill, and who knows, we didn't have many bills at all because the church was paid for. Thank God the building was paid for. And she'd run the bulletins. I would type the bulletins on a typewriter. Yes. And she would run them off on a copy where the copy, the whole top it would do this. Y'all remember those? And she'd run the probably 40 or 50 copies that we needed for Sunday, and she would fold them graciously for me. Other than that, during the week, during the work hours, no one ever came to the church, ever. I jokingly said I could have gone to work in my underwear every day, and no one would have known, right? Can I tell you when no one, and sometimes it's nice when people stop by just to say hi. I would have even taken somebody with a complaint. It's kind of boring working by yourself all day when no one was looking. Nobody's looking over my shoulder. I poured my life into the Word. I'm so thankful for those years because now I get interrupted all the time. I never have a day when I don't get interrupted anymore. I praise God for those times that I could pour in and even learn how to do what I do when those times when no one was looking. Yes, I could have spent all my time in there taking naps and doing whatever, but I never did that. Who are you? when no one's looking. 
What are you looking at with your eyes when no one's looking? What are you doing with your time and your talent and your ability when no one's looking? My friends, if you're not giving your life to Jesus, I mean, volunteering your life, all of your life, whatever it is that you have for his service, you're not ready. Isn't it amazing the people that are living in this world right now that don't want to spend time with the people of God in the house of God, but they think they're going to spend eternity in God's house with those same people? Man, that's a harsh word, isn't it? If you are able-bodied and have the ability to come and worship with other believers and you're choosing not to do so, do you realize how ridiculous that is? I don't need to be looking. You know, there's a camera here somewhere. Do you know how ridiculous it is to say that I'm doing church at my house with a cup of coffee and my feet up on the, on the table in front of me and isn't this great? Technology is awesome. But yes, you're going to go to heaven and spend eternity with the people that you could have been doing church with while you're alive. Do you realize how ridiculous that is? I'm glad you're going to have to explain that to Jesus and not me. Because I don't know how in the world you can claim to be a believer and not want to be with the people of God. I could not survive if I could not be with the people of God. And I plan to be there with all of you for eternity. Folks, the stakes are real and the stakes are high. One last thing, the life of commitment. These are Jesus' words, obviously. He's telling us some things in, in between here. We need to really understand how do we, this is a really good question for the day, how do we not knowing, could it be tomorrow? Yes. Could it be 10 years from now? Could it be 100? Yes. How do I just live my life, the rest of the life? Let's say that God's going to give me 20 more years on this planet. How do I live those 20 years the way he wants me to live those 20 years? That's a really good question. In other words, how do I finish well? Well, he tells you exactly how to do it right here. Let's talk about it. Number one, number one, who we are called to be. He tells us exactly who we're called to be. Verse 45, listen. And then is the faithful and sensible slave whom the master, his master, who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom the master will put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time. Parenthesis, how can I trust you? Who are we to be? Three words, faithful. I love that word. It's, one of my, it's my favorite attribute of God. There's a lot of good ones, aren't there? But his faithfulness is just amazing, isn't it? New and fresh every single day. It's the word pistos. It's an interesting word. It means trustworthy, steadfast, one who keeps his promises. The first thing he would say to everyone in this room is be that person. Be that guy. Be that girl. If you hear me say a promise to you, be the person who backs that up. Be a person that's trustworthy. Someone you can bank on. Someone you can count on. And how many of us have friends that are swimming in your mind right now? You know good, good and well if they tell you, they make you a promise, you know they're not going to keep it. Let your word be your bond. Be a person that's trustworthy. Then he says uh, the word sensible. This is an interesting word. Phronimus. Phronimus. Listen to this. It means wise in relations with others. First, be a person that you can be trusted, a person that if you make a promise, you keep a promise. Second of all, deal with other people right. Be sensible. We're going to deal with each other, men, good, bad, and ugly, warts and all, right? Care about one another. Go the extra mile with one another. Don't be the, I met people all the time, well, I went to church and there was a hypocrite there, so I, I had to go find me another church. Really? If there are 400 people in this room this morning, there's probably 400 hypocrites in here. Let's just be honest. Good luck on finding that church without one of those, especially if you go join it. Hello. Be sensible. You know what you should expect in any church? People that fall down and fall down often. That don't always do it right. Who mess up. But if you're a sensible person, you'll be a person who will deal with things like that the right way. One day I'm going to be in a ditch. I hope not, but I might be in a ditch and somebody's going to reach their hand down in that ditch and help me out. And the glory of the church is next month you may be in the ditch and I'll be the first one there to help you out. Right? 
Be sensible. Number three, he says, be a slave. Really a slave? One who voluntarily submits to another. Voluntarily. Did you hear that? Not because someone takes a whip and whips across your back and says, bow down, but voluntarily. Listen to me. The day you met Jesus, I hope was the day you surrendered your life to him. To be a slave is to lay aside your desire, your will, your plan, and pick up the desires of the master, right? And so what happens in life, and it's a beautiful thing along my life, I found times when, when I laid something aside and God said, that's okay, I want that over here too. But when you're willing to say, God, here's the plans I made for my life, here's what I thought was best for my life, but if that's not what you want, that's not what I want. I want your will to be done. And what you'll find out is some of those things he might want to still include, but he's got some other things he wants to include. I've started praying over the last year, every morning of my life, a prayer of surrender. God, this is your day. I want to be your man. I had some plans for today, but if you want to wipe those away, that's fine. I just want to do what you want me to do. Matthew Dennis taught me the greatest thing I've ever heard. He said, Phil, sometimes when I pray, I ask God what he wants me to pray about. Never dawned on me. I'm his slave, not because I have to, but because I want to, right? That is who we should be. We should be faithful, we should be sensible, and we should be a slave, gladly serving our king. Number two, what we are called to be. Then he talks about what we're called to be, and it's an interesting word, this 46th verse. Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. So doing when he's come. I talked earlier about who you are when no one's watching. How many times have we started and stopped something for Jesus? How many times have we made a commitment to something? You know, we're coming into that new year where I'll make a new year's resolution. I might as well do the one I didn't do last year and the year before that. I'll try it again. And usually it's I'll try to lose a few pounds or I'm going to start eating right or I'm going to start reading the Bible every day or whatever. And we get to about March and we fall down and so we just give up. Blessed is the slave. This is Jesus talking. Let me verbalize. Blessed is my child who when I come back, I find them being faithful. Wow. I remember there were times when I was a boy, my mother would say, Phil, I need you to do this, that, or whatever. And there were times I did it even when she wasn't watching, and there were times I didn't. Your value to the kingdom is amazing when you're faithful to it. What, what would happen if God knew he could trust you with an assignment and he could walk away and know it would get got done? There are people in this church like that, you know that? Kathy Horton. Yeah. I suspect if I asked her to do anything, I could just forget about it. Vicki Chandler, other people, Miss Melanie back here, people that you know, y'all know who they are. If I ask them to do something, I can just move on to the next thing because I know it's going to get done. Deidre, people like that in my mind right now that I just, if I give them an assignment, I'm just going to go on and do the next thing because that's going to be taken care of. As God looks at this world, as he looks at you, what does he think of you? What's your track record on the things he's asked you to do? that you've maybe started but never finished. Don't you want to be that person? I've rode the bench. Listen to me. I played sports when I was in school. Y'all would, would have been impressed with me back then. I was as tall as I am right now, and I played point guard for Hicks in high school. I was Mr. Basketball. I got the trophy in my office to prove it in 1981. I was really good. I was an excellent golfer, really good at those kinds of things. But I have rode the pine a few times. I've sat on the bench and wished like the Dickens that I could get in the game. I don't want to be on the bench I want to be useful in his hands. I don't want to be a tool that's been set aside because it doesn't work anymore. I want to be useful in his hands. He's saying, be the kind of person. If he gives you an assignment, I can move on because I know that my child is going to work diligently just like I'm here if I'm not here. Blessed is that one, he says, that he finds so doing, so doing. One last thing and we're done. The witness of the outcome. Witness the outcome. 
What's going to happen, Phil, if I become that kind of person? What's going to happen if I submit my life daily to him as we are waiting for his coming back? Remember the old days, don't be at the movie theater if Jesus comes back. Y'all remember that kind of craziness? It may be depend on what movie you've gone to see, but that's a whole other story. The point is simply this. How do I get ready? How can I be prepared while I'm waiting? Be that kind of person, who you should be and what you should do, what you're doing what you're supposed to do. And then finally, notice what he says will happen if we do that. Number one, he will reward the faithful. He says very clearly, verse 47, wonderful verse. Bless the slave whom this master finds so doing. Truly I say to you, verse 47, that you will, that you will put in him in charge of all his possessions. Man, if you're faithful, he's going to give you greater responsibilities as anyone would do. Matthew chapter 25, verse 23 says, His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21 says this, He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. Those are his words. If you will be faithful to me, you'll be really glad you did. I got a special place for you. Years ago, I, I got to go with a guy named Randall Hauser, who is a member of our church, and because of health and distance, they're not able to be here often, but I stay in touch with him. And he had become really good friends with, with uh, the coach at Tennessee, basketball coach, I won't call names right now, but he had become such good friends, he had seats on the bench. And I'll never forget, he got, he got to take me to a game one time, and we, walked, we didn't walk in the door with all the peasants. No, no, no. <laughs> we walked through a special door. We didn't have to walk down any stairs. We walked in a, uh, uh, y'all been to Thompson Ball, and it's a huge building on top of whatever, and there's, I mean, it's a huge thing. And we walked in on the floor, where we just walked in onto the floor. We didn't have to walk, we didn't have to walk up those you know, stands up in there with those peasants up there. There were, there were a row of seats just right behind the bench where we got to sit. I felt like royalty that day. Your master says, be faithful. Trust me. I'm going to get you through this. No matter what you face, know this. If you'll be faithful when no one's looking, I've got a special place in his right by my side. I don't understand that. I wish I could. But it's true because of who said it. Amen. I'm going to reward the faithful, he says. Number two, don't miss this. He'll reject the unfaithful. He's going to reject the unfaithful. <laughs> Look with me beginning in verse 48. He says, but if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is coming for a long, not coming for a long time. I meet people all the time that say this to me. I'm going to go do my thing, and I, when it's time, I'll get right with God and whatever. You know what? Everybody doesn't die in a hospital. Did you know that? Amen. I have done hundreds and hundreds, nearly I think a thousand funerals in my life. And lots of those people did not die in a hospital at 100 years old. I buried children and teenagers that fell out of the back of pickup trucks, and you name it, I... You, Everybody has a, you know, here's my plan. I'm going to go do my thing for 50 years, and then I'll give the rest of my life to Jesus. Everybody doesn't live to be 50. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master's not coming for a long time, I can do my own thing. The master's away right now. I'll just play video games on my computer instead of telling people about Jesus. Or I'll, I'll just read this trash or look at this garbage on the internet instead of studying my word and, and being an example worth following. I'm just going to play this thing called the Christian life and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him in an hour which he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites in a place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Write two things down and we're done. Number one, his judgment will be swift when you do not know. Not here, here. Instantly. Instantly. There's not going to be a warning sign. Hey, the, the boss is coming back next week. We better get things together and get everything spiffied up before he gets back. No, he's just going to show up on his timing. 
And on that day, he will separate that which is genuine from that which is false. From those that were playing games and those that were real with him, it'll be swift. Number two, his judgment will be sure. It's an interesting verse, this verse 51. He will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites in a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This word uh, cut in pieces, very complex word, dichomitimai, bitekomagai, that's hard to say. <laughs> Literally means this, listen to this. It is what the priest would do when he would cut an animal up and place them on the altar to be burned. He says, I will take those that have played games and did not do it the way I asked them to do it and thought that they could just get by by being religious instead of having a relationship with me. I will cut them in pieces and place them in a place where they'll burn. Wow. It's going to be quick. But count on it, it's going to be sure. I meet people from time to time that say, you know, who cares if I go to hell? It's just going to be a big party there. All my friends are going to be there. It's not going to be what you think. Every person who can hear my voice right now, whether you're in this room, you're watching this on television right now at your house, or you're hearing this on the radio, listen to me. There are only two kinds of people in this room right now. You're either saved or you're lost. Oh, I know there's male and female. Some of us, like Brian over here, we got pretty heads and we let people see more of our heads, right? Some of y'all have wonderful long hair. Some of you are male, some are female, some are tall, some are short, some are young, some are a little bit older. Some of us are kind of in the middle of all that. I used to think 60 years old was old. Now I think, ah, it's just getting started, right? Come on, amen, <laughs> right? Yeah, there's lots of things we could divide over, but when it comes right down to it, there's just two kinds of people here today, saved, or lost. And every person who's in this room right now is one of those two. There's no third option. I'll take option B. I'll take door three. No. You're either saved or you're lost. No in between. I can't answer the question for this, but here's what the Bible says. If I'm genuinely in Christ Jesus, I become a brand new creation. Not a perfect person, but definitely a different person. If there's no fruit in your life to bear out to the world that something's changed within you, how could you count on that for your salvation? I meet people that say, well, I got baptized when I was a baby. Show me in the Bible where it says that getting baptized is saving you. It's not. I joined the church. I've had perfect attendance for the last 18 years in Sunday school. That's wonderful, and I'm really glad for you, but that's not what saves you. Only Jesus does. A personal relationship with a God who loved you so much that he sacrificed his very life for you. That's what it is. And so, who are you? And what are you? And what does the fruit of your life bear out to the whole world? The genuine answer to that. My friends, you're either saved right now, and you know it, or you're lost. And most likely, you know that too. He says, be ready. The first step in getting ready is to get on that ark. Get in Jesus. Give him your life. Sacrifice your will for his will and allow him to save your very soul. Those of us that know Jesus, listen to me. The times of playing games, that's over, my friends. That ship already sailed. It's time to get serious about this faith that we have. We need to be telling our friends about Jesus because he may be coming very soon. And the saddest day for us would be that there'd be someone that we love, somebody that we were so busy we didn't have time to go tell them, and swiftly Jesus comes, and we miss our opportunity. We will be held responsible for that. And so are we ready? Because I tell you what, when you least expect it, expect it. It's kind of like a dual-edged sword, Lord, knowing that you're coming. And really knowing that's true, but not knowing when that is. We all have the tendency, God, to put off till tomorrow what we could do today. Lord, I pray somehow, some way that you would quicken our spirits to understand that being prepared is a daily exercise of being the very person you've called us to be, doing what you've called us to do, 
never again out of a sense of duty, never again because it's the right thing to do, but God, because you have done so much for us, our love for you in return compels us out of a sense of love and appreciation and joy to serve the King. God, what you need right now are people that claim to be believers acting like it and living like it and talking like it and witnessing like it before it's too late. Lord, I don't know what needs to happen in this room right now. We're walking through a passage of Scripture that doesn't have an ending just yet. And so we just kind of have an awkward stop. But oh, what a place to stop. We know one day you're going to reward those that have been faithful, but at the same time, God, you're going to reject those who were unfaithful. And I pray, Father, that every person who can hear my voice right now can find that place in their heart to make this right. I pray that the multitudes know that they know that they know that they're in you, but God, if there's a doubt, today's the day to make that right. So if you're here this morning, listen to me carefully and you don't know that you know that you know that you're saved, I promise you, He wants you to know. He doesn't want you to wander around and and just hope or think. He wants you to know. That word gnosko literally means to know that you know that you know that you know. And the only way you can know is surrender your life to Him. For God so loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. My friend, it's not how good you are, how good you can be. It's how great He is and how spectacular His grace is. We are not saved because of our merit. We're saved because of His merit. If you would throw yourself on His mercy right now, believe that He is who He says He is, and that He could forgive you of your sin, if you'd ask Him to do that and ask Him to save your soul, He'll do it, I promise. You can walk from this place today and never worry about that ever again. Salvation is 100% a work of God. It's not how good you are. It's how great He is. Lord, across this room, you know those hearts. Speak to those hearts now. For those of us that know that we're in Christ, but God also knows that we get so easily distracted by the things of this world, that we give way too much of our attention to the things of this world and not enough to the fact that you may be coming soon and we need to be ready. Father, I pray there be a greater sense of alertness within us to the supernatural, not just the natural. And so God, do your handiwork in this time. We love you. Oh, we're so thankful that you're here. We're thankful for your grace and your mercy. We're thankful that you're able to save. You're able to fix and repair and and put things back together that have been broken by this world. And so do your surgery in your body, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.